the budget. Uh, the thunder that I was going to steal from Brad, I'm still going to steal. Um, so what, what, what you're going to see um, in the presentation is basically a real simple presentation because revenue has not changed. Um, there, there is no more room in the budget this year um, than there was last year. And so the thunder that I'm going to, to steal from Brad is if you go all the way down to number nine, you will see that I, I have in the recommended budget um, the 1.1% bonus again for this year, this coming up year. Now, that being said, um, we are doing it, or my recommendation is to do it a little bit different this year, um, and that is for non-238 day employees, and, and 238 sounds weird because we're used to 240, but you remember because of the calendar, all the contracts have been diminished by two days, but the pay has not been diminished at all, so it's been unaffected. So for less than 238 day employees, they would get the 1.1% bonus. So that's basically APs, teachers, um, uh, all the hourly employees, maintenance, um, that kind of thing. So um, for 238 day employees though, instead of the 1.1% bonus, I'm recommending that we do uh, a further reduction of work days to coincide with the July 4th week. All right, so basically what that would allow 238 day employees to do is have the entire week off at July 4th, because you always get, you already get the one day for the holiday, then we've reduced by two days um, already due to the calendar. So this would be an additional two days reduction that would allow 238 day employees to have the full week of July 4th without having to take vacation days. Um, I ran this by my principal's advisory group um, because again, that, you know, it's, it's principals and, and those kind of employees. So I wanted to see what the thoughts were. Uh, they, they thought it was an awesome idea. Um, and so we are making a little bit of differentiation this time because again, the 1.1% the bonus would be um, primarily the, the, the largest group of employees would be for the teachers. Um, they would get that bonus. Um, so that is the one difference in how this is listed on our, our budget because again, uh, as you know, it's required by law that I present you a balanced budget. So this is a balanced budget again. Um, the 1.1% bonus is one-time money. So going back to our earlier conversation as far as sustainability, this is a one-time deal. There's nothing guaranteed that we can do this next year or that I would recommend to do it next year. I'm not saying I will or I won't. Uh, but for this current budget, I believe that this is kind of a good combination um, that does differentiate. Um, and, and I know that we've talked about in the past doing a raise across the board. Um, but for, for this particular um, benefit, perk, uh, if, if you will, um, that, that we think this makes uh, a good differentiation um, to be able to make. I think it's a positive to be able to differentiate in this manner. Such, uh, so, Brad, I will uh, turn the budget presentation over to you. Very well. Good afternoon, Board. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Board, Mr. Superintendent, Today marks the beginning of the 2019 budget uh, presentations and discussion with the board. The CCSD annual budget development process is probably one of the most impactful strategic tasks that the board engages in each year. For today's meeting, I have two reports to review with you as we start budget discussions. One is the 2019 budget calendar and the other is the FY 2019 budget overview. Both of those you have at your desk today. Uh, we'll also have them on the overview. Uh, so let me go ahead and re start right in with the first report. It's the budget calendar. <clears throat> so the budget calendar is a, a finance organizing document to ensure that the district has a professional organized process in which to produce a $1 billion budget. The calendar represents a variety of tasks that must be completed in a sequence of events 
to ensure that the final product produces organized information so that the superintendent and the board will have the data and the estimates that you need to make the best possible decisions. When you review the calendar, you will see that the format is organized in date order on the left. Each task is listed as an important part of a sequence of events to prepare the budget. Each task has a target date, a responsible person, and an event description of what is to be accomplished at that time in the budget process. A review of the document shows that the preparation of the budget began back in November of last year to prepare uh, project or to project personnel allotments based on student counts and instructional needs. The budget department begins its preparation on about the same time uh, on about the same time frame to to compile literally tens of thousands of salary, benefit, and operating accounts organized by business functions for review by the supervisor of each business function. The budget department has detailed instructions uh, for each department and function for their review of their accounts. The process ensures that every single account is reviewed on an annual basis. The budget department compiles all this information for presentation to the superintendent for his review and his input. Just as in previous years, it is the superintendent's task to present a balanced budget to the board to maintain good operations of the district. Beginning in late February and in March, the superintendent and executive cabinet finalized the budget for a presentation to the board. And as a result, that brings us to today as we present the results of the budget development process thus far. The remainder of the budget calendar is a schedule of additional meetings as the board continues with their consideration of the budget. On April 19th, a budget hearing is scheduled for 630 prior to the night board meeting and the tentative budget is a schedule for approval on that night. As always, the tentative budget is tentative and can be changed, but, as, but we move forward in this manner every year in order to advertise the budget to the citizens of Cobb County. On May 17th, another budget hearing is scheduled for 12.30 p.m. with an illegal adoption of the budget scheduled for approval at the night board meeting. The remainder of the budget calendar includes a schedule of property tax digest meetings that are required by law. Uh, they're required specific meeting dates that are in the actual coding of the law. This is a continuation of, pre of the previous year where three digest meetings are scheduled two meetings on July 10th and another meeting on July 19th and the final approval of the digest scheduled for July 19th right after that last meeting. <clears throat> this concludes the presentation of the budget calendar, but this should give the board an idea of what's been taking place, uh, what the budget's going to be looking like today as we present and how it looks moving forward. Okay, my next uh, report do you have at your, at your desk is the budget overview. And this is an executive summary of the 2019 general fund tentative budget for consideration by the board. Uh, this is a one page document, but believe me, there are millions of pages that have gone into this and a lot of meetings and a lot of work and a, tens of thousands of accounts. And you have a copy of this document at your desk. Uh, the format of this report is similar to the previous years in which we have included columns across the top for revenue, expenditures, and comments on the right side to assist in clarifying each budget item. Before we go line by line on this report, let me comment in general about the 2019 general fund budget, some highlights. Number one, the 2019 tentative general fund budget presented today is balanced, and that's a requirement for, to, for us to present to you today. Number two, the proposal utilizes $7.8 million in fund balance. Three, the proposal contains no millage increase as the millage rate presented remains at 18.9 mils. Four, the proposal contains a salary step for eligible employees based on their salary schedule. Five, the proposal contains a 1.1% bonus for non-238 day employees. And finally, the proposal contains a decrease in the work year for 238 employees in lieu of a bonus. Now, let me make some comments on revenue and expenditure appropriations before I go line by line on the budget overview. <clears throat> hey, 
as you know, there's two types of revenue for the district, the two major types of revenue. One is local revenue and one is state revenue. Let me make some comments on local revenue. Uh, we are making an assumption so far, and we have close contact with the tax assessor, but our assumption is that the property digest will grow at a net growth, net of exemptions of 6%. Uh, we will know the actual digest probably sometime in late June or early July at the latest. Uh, local uh, revenue has been developed with no general fund millage increase, continuing the 18.9 general fund millage rate. Uh, as you know, there is a millage rate cap at 20 mills for our district uh, for which we cannot exceed. The district has no long-term debt, so our district does not have to have a separate debt service millage rate to pay off long-term debt, so we're very fortunate there. The other source of revenue is state revenue. So for FY 2019, we look at student growth as being relatively flat, uh, but we will receive training and experience growth uh, money in, in the amount of approximately $5.6 million. That's the training and experience that go with the certain population of teachers that we have currently. Other state revenue factors include a local fair share change, which will decrease revenue by another $10.5 million. So local fair share will increase from $145 million to $155 million. There is an increase in teacher retirement system, uh, employer withholding from 16.81% to 20.9%. This is a fairly large increase. Uh, the good thing is, is that the state's giving us some money to f help fund that. They're giving us approximately $16.5 million, but the total cost to us is $20 million. So they're giving us approximately two-thirds of the amount to fund that. The state continues to have austerity cuts uh, for CCSD, and we will continue right now as it sits uh, that we'll have uh, another $10 million cut in revenue because of the austerity cuts. So the net revenue increase for all state adjustments, where I net all those changes together, is only about, about $6.8 million. And I'll just make a statement here that if we didn't have the TRS increase, where they gave us some money but it cost us more, but if we didn't have the $16.5 million in in state revenue for the TRS increase, we would have actually a decrease in state revenue. So as we keep in mind our two sources of revenue, we're having essentially state revenue that is decreasing. Uh, and, and so as long as we have flat student growth, this will become a problem for us moving forward in the future. On the expenditure side, uh, expenditure appropriations, uh, as a result of the uh, available revenue, there is a salary step included for all eligible employees. The, generally, the value of a step increase for employees is approximately 1.5%. So that's good for you board members to understand what that is. So with those general comments, let me turn to detail on the report. And I'll just go line by line. And hopefully, you'll be able to follow me to see how this exactly works. And let me put on my glasses here. It's a little wordy here. Uh, so I'll start with the first row. So you see uh, the original budget, and you all should be familiar with that row because that's what you all approved last May in the original budget. The second row are board approved adjustments, and you all are familiar with these adjustments because you have seen these adjustments in the quarterly report so far in the current year. And so there's been $9.8 million of adjustments. So then in the third row, we have a revised budget of $1 billion, $23 million compared to an expenditure budget of $1 billion, $36 million. <clears throat> and again, you should be familiar with this because that's the exact totals that we've been reviewing on the quarterly report, and I had the quarterly report presented to you last month. Now, as we go ahead and prepare uh, the budget, we like to have uh, an incremental approach to the budget because then you can see what you approved last year and then you can see as board members each incremental change to the budget as we move along and you can understand it. And actually it's valuable for us as well because then we know, have we forgotten anything? I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to a billion dollar budget. So we, we carefully balance these figures and, and that's how we go about it. <clears throat> 
The first row on the, on the revised budget for the uh, 2019 figures, let me just start and you see on the left-hand side, I'll go item by item. So item number one. Item number one, we're uh, <clears throat> projecting a 6% growth estimate and that yields approximately $24.7 million. Uh, just for you as a board member, this is approximately 3.5 to 4.0 million dollars for each percent that we get in the increase in the digest. You also need to know that this 6% growth is net of exemptions. So when we do get the property digest and you'll see a growth figure, they usually quote the gross increase in the digest. You all are very aware that we have a lot of exemptions in the school district that affect our property digest. Uh, and I think that when the tax assessor presented their number last year, it seemed like it was higher than 6%, and it was, but they were talking about the gross digest increase. But when you take it, uh, into account all the exemptions that the school district gives up for revenue, we think it's still gonna be somewhere in the range of a 6% net figure, okay? Line item number two. Line item number two, I th think I've already kind of alluded to this, but this is a summary of the state revenue, and there you can see that the state revenue is only growing by a net increase of $6.8 million. And I'll just repeat it again, local fair share increased by $10.5 million from 145 million to 155 million. The, teacher, the TRS teacher pension employer portion for teachers increased from 16.81% to 20.9%. The state increased revenue and covered 16.5 million of the $25 million cost of this change. The state continued a $10 million austerity cut, and the net of all these changes, there's a few other small changes, but the net of all the changes, I just listed uh, or told you the major ones, is a $6.8 million increase in state revenue. Light item number three is the net change for all other revenue sources. So frequently, you'll hear me talk about two major sources of revenue, and we do. It's local revenue and state revenue, but we have a, a variety of other revenues that we don't talk about because they're not quite as big. But let me just list a few of them, because <clears throat> we're talking about a net increase of $4.6 million for all those other revenue types. Things like property tag revenue for cars, delinquent property tax, intangible tax revenue, real estate transfer tax, alcoholic beverage revenue, liquor by the drink revenue, uh, interest income, cell tower revenue, sales assets, ROTC federal reimbursement for instructor salaries, Medace revenue and Medicase revenue. Those are some of the revenue types that I'm talking about. What finance has done is we've taken all those revenue uh, accounts. We've looked at what uh, we're experiencing this year. We've also taken prior years and trying to uh, come up with a trend. And our best guess is that uh, when we adjusted all these accounts and it came out to a net increase of $4.6 million. It could be higher, could be lower but that's our best guess at this point. Okay, number f the next line item is number four. Number four is, uh, we'll go to the expenditure side of the budget where we reduce one-time expenditures from the prior year. So by definition, if it was a one-time cost in the current year, we don't need to spend that cost again so we can extract, uh, ex subtract it from the budget totals going forward next year. And you'll see a decrease of $18 million that includes the bonus that we paid this year, but uh, we can sub subtract the $4.2 million for property and $5.6 million for architects. Next line item is line item number five. Line item number five represents additional resources for schools when they open. This budget has always been included uh, for additional funds for new schools, for extra work days, and custodial functions when schools open. Next year's budget includes these costs for East Cobb and Brumby. Line item number six are salary and benefit changes. So there's three major changes that we're talking about here. Uh, we're including a salary step for eligible employees and we estimate it to be in the $12 million range. 
We're increasing the TRS portion again from the 16 to 20 percent for $25 million cost estimated. And then we're also increasing the non-certified health insurance to annualize the previous year increase. So you will recall in the budget last year, the increase started halfway through the la year last year. So we included only enough money to take us halfway through the year. This year, we have to annualize it to fund the whole year. The next line item is line item number seven, which are salary and position adjustments. Um, included in the budget, after we've tried to estimate everything, there was money left over for six additional instructional positions. We have there an upgrade for middle school and high school bookkeepers, and we also have seven additional custodians to maintain additional square footage, and that's part of a formula that we use in the budget. The next line item is line item number eight, and it's an evaluation of miscellaneous accounts. And there are a bunch of miscellaneous accounts that we look at very carefully, but the ones that I want to point out for sure to you is in this, in this line item, uh, we're dis decreasing the budget by $526,000. But what we do is we look at accounts like cell towers and do, you know, what, what is the money that's going to come in and be spent for that next year? And it depends on the cell tower company and when we get that money in. So we adjust for that in the budget next year. We also have an adjustment for charter school funding based on a decrease in projected students. And we also have an adjustment to general fund grants on both the revenue side and the expenditure side to reflect grant funding estimates for next year. Now, of course, these are estimates. Um, and we won't know exactly on some of the grants until the fall of this coming year. So the net changes of these is a decrease of $526,000. The last item on the budget is line item number nine. And we've already done this, but I'll say it again. For the non-238 employees, most of which are in the categories of teachers, pair of pros, bus drivers, nurse, nurses, maintenance, they'll get a 1.1% bonus. For 238-day employees, the budget includes a decrease of two days in its work year in lieu of the bonus. Mr. Chair, this seems like a, a short executive summary, but this is a summary that summarizes exactly what we've done in the budget. But, it, but this summary is, a, is a, a conclusion of an awful lot of work uh, by the budget department and finance, and actually, for each individual department because we send out reports to each individual department. Somebody's responsible for every one of these accounts. They look at their reports, they analyze these reports, they send it back to us, they sign off on it. Everything is accountable and we look at all these reports. Um, at our next meeting in April, Financial Services will present the 2019 budget once again and we will provide more detail in the next meeting. You all are used to having a budget notebook we will have that. Uh, we will start putting as much information as we have on the internet. Uh, also, the budget calendar that I presented earlier summarizes our budget schedule. Meetings are scheduled and data will be presented so that you will have the information to make decisions. As always, uh, if the budget uh, discussions evolve, this is just a preliminary schedule. Things can be changed, uh, and I'm sure the superintendent will be talking about that if that's necessary. So, Mr. Chair, this is our presentation for today, and we are available for questions and hopefully answers. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Scamhorn, you had a question? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, I have a couple. One is on uh, line item number five, opening new schools. You mentioned East Cobb and Brumby, but you, you did not mention uh, the Digital Academy. I did not mention that. Uh, I'll need to check my schedule <clears throat> and the formula for that so I can look into that. Okay. And that, uh, I mean, we, we moved to principal, so we are going to open that this year, this coming year, correct? Yeah, let, let me speak to that a little bit. Um, generally, th this is um, for, for new construction um, to where there's some moving time and uh, the, the need to pay employees additional days to, to come to, to work earlier than their contract may dictate um, and custodian costs and those kind of things. Um, for the, the Oakwood 
Um, that is an existing campus, although it's being transformed, if you will, uh, conceptually. Uh, the physical building is, is not going to be any, uh, any new construction. So that's generally what this line item is to, when it says open new schools. Probably a more um, apt description would be to open newly constructed schools. And, and I'll change the wording on that, Chris. Okay, I mean, uh, I'm not going to make a big case out of it, but there will be extra cost on opening that digital academy. So. Yeah, and, and if you remember, I mean, I'm struggling myself because it's been, a, it's been a minute, but in the presentation, you remember we made it budget neutral, but all of those costs are incurred in the entire budget for opening that facility. So, yes, it's not going to be that they're going to have to go in there and do, you know, what others are not expected to without additional costs and, and, and okay. uh, employees and those kind of things. Thank yep. you. And yes, then, sir. Uh, one other question, and we had this conversation last year, and we may want to carrying on uh, later after the meeting, but I'm not seeing a budget forecast that we used to get every year. And this is either the second or third year that, you know, that third sheet we used to get. And uh, I, I'm at a loss as to why we don't get that sheet anymore because it, it's a trend that I think has got good information that keeps us from basically doing some digging into all that uh, information to try to dig it out ourselves. To me, I, I like it not only gives, gives us a trend, but it also is an executive summary sheet. You know, uh, this is good, but, and, and you mentioned that we can watch the change in numbers here, okay, but I, I don't see a trend. This is just an arbitrary sheet. I mean, it's good, but I don't know why we don't do the budget forecast anymore. So, Mr. Yeah, Scammell, yeah, Mr. Scammellhorn, we used to start the budget earlier, and what happened to us is that we would start the budget, and, and we do start the budget in a detailed way back in November, uh, well, October and November of the previous year. But what we ran into is that we were preparing the budget pretty blindly. Uh, we really didn't know. Uh, we hadn't. You know, the tax assessor at that point didn't have information as far as property digest information. Uh, we really know nothing about the state budget until the legislature starts meeting. And, and quite frankly, the key point there is when the governor presents his budget uh, to the legislature probably in mid-January to late January. So we ran into issues where uh, the, uh, the budget, it was hard to start it early and give you good numbers. And, one of the things for me is I, I want to give you good numbers, and then uh, when we don't, when it's just such a wild guess, it just makes me nervous. And and so uh, at this point in the year, uh, we we feel better about the numbers, uh, but I do want to give the board members what you need as far as uh, to vote on the budget. Well, that's in my mind, and, and I'm I always try to have an open mind, but that's what I feel like I need. And uh, on that uh, budget <coughs> forecast, I, I believe it used to have the last two years, which the numbers are real. I mean, they're set in stone. Is that correct? Pretty much. Maybe not the SPLOS items, but. Probably if I did another budget forecast, I'd put in the actual numbers for the previous yeah. years and then plug these numbers into that. Uh, so I'll just have to talk to the superintendent and see how we how we want to proceed with and, that. And I appreciate that November, even January, the numbers are pretty sketchy. But we're in middle to end of March, you know, moving for a hopefully a made vote. So we're only six, about 60, 90 days out, right? So sure, there's going forecasts that just the, by definition not to be too basic or trying to but we, uh, we understand that. So uh, I'm requesting that we continue to get that, maybe not at an early date, like this November, December, but certainly by February, March. I don't, I don't, I'm open, I'm all ears about why we don't get it. Uh, and good presentation. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if there's any further explanation to that. That is information we can do and we can prepare that relatively easily well mr chair does that mean we're going to or do we have to talk about it more later 
I, let me let me make sure I'm understanding because so if, if we give a but and Brad, you need to help me with this. If we do a budget forecast in February and March, like if we presented a budget forecast today, how is the forecast different than this tentative budget? Well, I, I think that this particular overview are incremental changes to the budget uh, where the forecast has prior years and they can see trends. And, and so that's that's the main difference. And so you can see the totals moving forward and previously and moving forward. It would just be a matter of plugging this into that. It's something we could easily do. Yeah. So uh, we'll plan on doing that. And I, I'm sensitive to, you know, you're nervous about numbers not being, uh, not knowing, you know, you're, of the forecasting so we don't have to have all of it but certainly there is a trend there that i like to see uh on the last two and then where we're going with this one uh, yeah so. what we can do is um uh the i think the term forecast is what's kind of throwing us the, brad and i off a little bit not that it's it's incorrect it's just we're we're thinking a forecast like what next year's budget is going to be, you know, like that far out. So what we'll do is we'll get the, um, what you just said, Brad, um, the, the report with these numbers plugged in so you can see the trend analysis, and we'll email that uh, to the board as soon as we get it. I mean, we'll start working on that, you know, ASAP yeah, and I'm get it out sure to I, the board. I'm pretty yeah. sure I understand the format that you're looking for yeah, because we've talked, talked about, about this it. before. Yeah, and uh, we can change the title, Trends Analysis. I mean, I'm not... Stuck on that. Yeah. Well, I, actually, basically, what I presented today is a forecast because I don't know. I mean, these are our best estimates at yeah. this time for next year. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Skimhorn. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Johnson, for all the work that's been put into this and coming up <clears throat> with hopefully something uh, reasonable. And uh, I am glad to see that the, the numbers are coming up to my, my bank account level. Uh, I do have a question about number two, uh, which is the QBE, uh, and we just saw and heard earlier today that our FTE numbers are going to start to flatten out for a while. Uh, it appears that the district's growth in uh, students is relatively flat for the next few years. How does this impact our state? of Georgia QBE revenue this year and for the future? So for this year, basically, we have very little state revenue, new state revenue for next year. So you're talking mm -hmm. about one of our major sources of revenue that has flattened out on us. Uh, we have six million, but it's really not six million because that's covering the TRS increase. Uh, I don't know where that puts us as far as moving forward. Uh, we have a revenue problem. Uh, our two main sources of local are local revenue and state revenue, and now we have a problem with state revenue. You might recall in previous years, we had the perfect storm with a bad economy. Our local revenue was attacked. Property values went down. State revenue, we had a huge austerity cuts. Uh, but now here we go again with state revenue with flat growth because we earn additional money by student growth. So if we don't have student growth in the state, then all we have left is uh, T&E money for our current teacher population. But that's not enough to counteract $10 million in austerity cuts and increases in local fair share. So at best, we, wa we will wash out on the revenue. At worst, we'll start taking cuts because our T&E revenue won't be enough to cover the austerity cuts and the increase in local fair share. I mean, that's, you know, there are other factors, but that's the main factor. So it's worrisome. So where do we go from here in the next few years? And we've talked about revenue issues for many years. Uh, and of course it was really acute back in the economic days of five or six years ago. Uh, but we're still not where we need to be from a revenue standpoint. And uh, I think Mr. Sweeney pointed out earlier in the meeting that we're 800, 800, I don't know the exact number, but 800 teachers down. And so if we start having another economic downturn, and that will happen at some point, you know, how will we approach it this time? 
So, you know, the budget is a is a um, is a uh, activity that's it's it's an annual activity, but it's also a strategic activity. So, are we looking? You know, we're looking mainly for next year. But I think the board needs to be very careful about, you know, what about the next few years? How does it look long term? Yeah, let, let me jump in here for a second, too, because, I, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I've said this publicly a, a lot, and I'll continue to say it. Our budget situation is never going to improve until an additional stream of revenue is, is identified. So that being said, I, you know, we always try to guard against, you know, crying wolf you know, because we don't want to be perceived as we're crying wolf. Um, you know, we, we have to continually deal with, um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, there's people out there that say, well, cut this or cut that or cut this position or cut that position, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I want to be very deliberate in what I'm about to say. Over the past few years, um, since 2008, when that first economic downturn happened, <coughs> We have cut until we are at the bone. There is nothing more to cut. And I'm not saying the board wants to cut. I, I'm, I'm mainly saying this because we have to get the message out to a level of understanding that the community understands exactly what our budget situation is. I mean, it, you know, it's no secret we, we identify the 62 and over exemption um, and, and what impact that has to us. We also, in the same sentence and the same breath, say we're not trying to say we need to do away with it or change it but it's an educational um, factor in that we need to educate um, the, co the community members about exactly what that impact does because when we say things like we have cut to the bone, that we can't af afford a 1.1% bonus, we literally hold our breath when we get the report of the exemptions. You know, just this past year, for example, when the Freeport went down the same amount, the 62 and over went up, that's the only way we were able to not have a deficit budget. Um, so, and, and unfortunately, the timing of those things do not line up such that it plays into uh, these numbers because we're, we're making an assumption on what those numbers are going to look like. So, when, when we talk about the budget and we, you know, we, Brad even indicated, you know, we've got a one sheet presentation for a billion dollar budget. Um, and while in most corporate circles that, that would seem pretty astronomical to, to think, or outlandish rather, to think you've got this kind of presentation for a billion dollar budget, unfortunately, the changes that you see, both positive and negative, and the way that they balance out is the only thing that we can do to survive. Um, it, it is that close. Uh, when we talk about it, it's actually closer to 900 teachers that were still down. Um, and just an, another factor um, to throw out there, um, to, to your number, Mr. Sweeney, you, you know, when we were talking about what number we use for teachers that includes benefits, now it's over $90,000 because of the additional TRS employer portion that's being attributed to us that we have to pay. So the average teacher cost is over $90,000. Well, multiply that times 900, there's no way in the world that we can even attempt to even think about that. Yeah, $81 million. So it, it's just not going to get any better. And normally I always say, and it, it aggravates me when people take glass half empty approach. I'm not certain that there's not a hole in our glass on this one. It's not just half empty, it's leaking. So, you know, in, in all seriousness, I mean, we are absolutely deliberate in trying to do what all we can for our employees. That's why line item number nine is in there at $7.8 million. And, and there'll be a lot of people to say, well, if your budget's so bad, then what about that? That's one-time money, okay? And again, there's nothing to guarantee that we'll be able to do anything next year. Um, I think that, that we, do, we need to do all we can when we can for our employees. Um, and that's why it's in here as, as a recommendation. That's why it's a little bit differentiated so that we can focus the, uh, the bonus on the teachers 
um, and, and being able to do everything we can to recognize that they are what allows us to be successful. But again, just to drill back down to the point, since 2008, we have cut and then obviously we did some raises uh, to try to get our morale back up, which we did, and it, and it is up and it is high, but we have cut to the bone. Um, so until additional revenue streams, whatever those are, because right now there, there's not any that's identified, right? Um, until those are identified, um, we just quite simply cannot talk about any kind of differing budget situation moving forward. So. Brad, unfortunately, you know, we always, you know, pinged him with, you know, always saying this is the worst budget year ever. It's the worst budget year ever from now until the foreseeable future because we are we are tapped out. Um, we are literally treading water. We can't take on any more water, and we can't get any higher up out of the water than than we are right now. So. Um, and I, and I know because I've, I've heard the people, I've read the comments in, in the media and these kind of things where, you know, they think we're quite crying wolf. And, you know, just, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, so we just need to be very cognizant and very deliberate about, you know, when we have the talking, the, the ability to talk to the public, we need to make sure that they're, they're educated and understand because we do, as you heard Mr. Wilson say, we've got one of the greatest school districts in the nation. People move here because of our schools. It, it's just really, it, it's really a shame that we can't uh, do anything more with our budget than we can, but it just, it is what it is right now. So I hope I hope that helps. Yeah, Brad. Well, let me uh, look at item number two again, which is our QBE formula. Uh, if, I, if I understand the numbers here, if the uh, FTE decreases about 3%, this goes to zero in the future. Well, actually, the state revenue, had we not had the TRS increase in revenue, it would be, the state revenue would be negative 10 right now as we yeah. stand. So we're in, a, we're in a danger spot right now. We're in a danger zone. Uh, let me go back to number one, which is our local tax. If that were to climb down to 4%, or 3% in the future, we're talking about eight to $12 million less than we have right now. And so uh, I've got another question for you. Uh, our budget continues to be built in factors like 10 million in state austerity cuts, which is happening on a regular basis, uh, increases to local fair share by 10 million, uh, and the property exemptions that have risen by 10 million in each of the last three years. With these kinds of cuts to our general fund, what will the budget look like in three to four years? Do you have a, some thoughts on that? Well, one thing I wanna tell the board, I want to provide you some assurance that administration and finance has really looked at this budget. I mean, we, we really look at every account. Uh, we send these accounts out to the administrators, they look at them, a lot of things just aren't arbitrarily continued. I mean, we really look at these things and people look at their budgets, they sign off on it, they manage their accounts. Another thing that we've tried to do to mitigate this is to try to budget as accurately as possible. Now this makes me lose some sleep a little bit because when you look at the financial uh, reports, the quarterly financial report, you will see consistently that on a quarterly basis, half a quarter way through the year, we are 25% spent. When, you know, halfway through the year, we are 50% spent. So I, ha I lose some sleep every time I look at those reports before I present it to you, because if I'm 1% over, that's, that could be nine to $18 million. So what we're trying to do Ooh. is our part to try to make these numbers as real as possible to, and, and what that, what's that, what that's been able to do is provide every single penny we can to uh, have the superintendent recommend to you things that we can do for our teachers. Uh, the budget, uh, I think the superintendent uh, stated that there's not much fluff in the budget. If you look at us compared to other school districts and there is a state report card out there, we are by far the lowest in administrative costs and support costs. 
and, and our percentage of, um, uh, of the budget to the classroom, and, and I know the superintendent talks a lot about this, focus on the classroom. And I know a lot of you board members have, have done that too, and, and I think this budget shows that, that we've taken the available resources we have and we've done all we can do with it on the expenditure side especially. There's not much we can do on the revenue side until there are some changes and additional resources brought to bear. Uh, we would like to do extra things for the teachers. Uh, every year when I prepare the budget, I just cringe before I tell the superintendent, I wish there was $50 million left over, but then that doesn't usually be the case. So uh, that's the assurance I can provide to the so, board so. as to far as to what the budget's gonna look like. I think that we can status quo with the budget for several years, but at some point we will hit a wall. We will hit a wall. So if the demographic numbers are correct and we start to decline in FTE, that means there's going to be less money coming from the state. Now, the other danger zone is are our ad valorem taxes going to stay at the same level each year by 6%? I don't think so, but I could be wrong. So that's going to have a major effect on our budgets. So. I, I can see maybe four years out, we, we hit that brick wall, and there's no raises, there's no, no, there, you know, there's just no extra expenditures. You, you pretty much walking in place. That, I, I would encourage uh, the board to take a strategic look at this budget and where we are going in the next three years. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Ms. Thayer. Mr. Sweeney, you next. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Great job as always. Um, my question is timing right now. I, if, if my understanding is correct, it's 4.54. We were supposed to dismiss at 5 o'clock. What time? 5.30. Okay. But we still haven't even gotten to our budget items yet. Um, and looking at the timeline, it says we have this discussion right now, and then we're supposed to vote on it on April the 19th. Um, I'd like a little time to think and go over these items like things like the nurse, uh, like the, the um, bookkeepers that may be good to give them to change their ranks, which would up their salaries, but should we have given the raises to the nurses? You know, there may be good reasons, but I'd like to discuss why we would be doing that over others. That's just one thing. And then other things like back in the fall, I had asked for to have a study before we got to budget time to look at our, one of the biggest problems in my, my schools and in Mr. Morgan's schools is substitutes. And to have information on what our, what our problems are in the areas of substitutes and did we need to do anything in that area before we looked at budget and we haven't gotten that information yet. So I'm just saying, and it shows, you know, before we could vote on it next time, it seems like to me we're, push, we're gonna be pushed in time for time now, here. Remember the vote in April is for the tentative budget. Um, so that does not in any way, shape or form um, put the budget in stone. So it's still tentative at that point in time. The vote for the tentative budget just allows us to advertise the tentative budget um, in, in the, in the uh, necessary methods required by law. So that's, that's why we wanted to get this in your hands today to do exactly what you're saying. Um, those questions that you have, Brad is more than uh, ready to, to meet with you individually. Uh, any kind of questions you might have on that. And, and those can be discussed at the next meeting, even though we're asking you to vote to approve the tentative budget. Again, it's still the tentative budget that the board can, can once, once the budget is presented, the tentative budget is presented to the board, I'm out. So it's, it's the board's budget at that point in time. So any kind of questions you want to ask about those things. So we have from now until the next meeting in April to discuss any of those things, communicate um, those with the board uh, for discussion and communication at the next meeting. And again, it's just the tentative budget that we're asking you to approve in April. Um, then in May, so we actually have a full eight weeks um, of, of mod modification time frame that the budget can be modified during that time, during that window. So even at the next 
next month's meeting, even when we vote on the tentative, we're not necessarily voting for each each specific item in this. Yeah, you're voting on on basically on the just budget the boundaries as a tentative budget, mm -hmm. and then that allows finance to advertise that tentative budget and okay. get the necessary th uh, check boxes, if you will, required by law. Of course, as of this minute, everybody who's all of our employees are sitting out there looking at this, thinking this is pretty much etch etched in stone right now. So, as as okay. far as um, yeah, as far as revenue. Yes, it is what it is. But like you said, you know, you might the have items. questions about, yes. you know, the individual items listed within there, like, for example, the change in rank of the bookkeepers kind of right. thing. So those can be worked out at any time. And even after uh, up to um, the final approval of the final budget, you can still tweak it after that if need be. But will at some point you talk about the rationale for some of these items and just like the the six additional instructional positions, we don't know what those are, the rationale or any of that. So... Is that going to, are you planning to present that to us to talk, tell us about what your thoughts were in these items? No. And, and the reason I say just point that simple is because I also, the detail is going to be with Brad. So we can certainly go into those questions now. Um, or it, you can get with Brad individually because somebody mm -hmm. might have a, a more specific question that is not related to something that, that's on here or not. Um, so you weren't going to explain to us what these thoughts were? Absolutely. Um, Brad can go into those details. That's why the comments are there, is to highlight exactly what's contained within these. Um, so Brad, you, you go ahead and, and, and address those details. Yeah, I can, I can address certain things that you mentioned, Ms. Thayer. Um, on the bookkeepers, uh, one of the things that has become an issue is that over the past seven years, there has been 110 new bookkeepers. And so it's very difficult to maintain that position at the salary level it was. And in fact, this current year, we have trained 34 new bookkeepers this year alone, and it's not even the end of the year. And so that's one of the things that we had talked about addressing in order to stabilize that position. In terms of the six instructional positions, that was the money that we felt like we had left over after working out all these numbers. And I think that we've talked about making our pool of positions larger so that we'll have some flexibility because we don't know, uh, and Al, uh, Dr. Um, Stouter can speak more to this than I can, but we don't know exactly what students show up in the fall. And so we have estimates now, but when the students actually show up in the fall, we, we need to have some flexibility to how to address classroom needs, and that was the reason for the six additional teachers. But let me jump in there, too. Um, and, and I apologize for the confusion, um, because if you'd asked me specifically about the six positions, I wouldn't have been able to answer the question. Now that Brad has said, that's the pool. So the allotment pool, right? Um, so just teachers. Exactly. Teachers or, and or parapros. Right, so, so that would actually be 12 pair pro positions or any combination thereof. So, so those six is the pool. And so to put it in perspective, um, now you've got me down the path, I'm gonna talk about it now. <laughs> so uh, to put that in perspective, a few years back, the pool would have been 50 to 60 positions. Now it's six. So, and, and that's general ed and special ed, okay? And remember, if a kid shows up and they've got an IEP, by law, we have to meet that IEP. So um, to have six positions is really um, scary, um, but, but that is what those are. That's, well, that makes that's sense. the pool. I didn't know whether that was instructional positions in the academic department right. or whether, not, what it was. Not net new positions, it's the pool. To okay. use for teachers and para pros. Okay, that yep. helps. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ms. Thayer. I should have probably clarified that no, a little better. That's okay, but that's when we've just got one thing and haven't had time to to, to right. digest it or talk about it. Right. Things aren't clear. So, okay, thank so, you. Some of the other things are custodians. Now, we have a formula in the budget to when we build new square footage and we need to maintain that, we have a formula for custodians. And so there's seven new custodians in there to maintain that square footage. Uh, it's possible to develop another formula, but that's just how the formula works now. And isn't that, John, you may or may not know this, um, I'm trying to pull up in my memory, isn't it 30,000 square foot 
per custodian? Mr. Ragdale, your memory for numbers is, is infinitely better than mine will ever be, so I will defer to you, sir. I, and I think we adjusted that at one point in time up. Um, it may be 33,000 square feet, which is kind of crazy if you think about that for one custodian, but that's that's the formula. But that's so, self-explanatory. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's understandable because yeah. we're adding square footage, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But can. it also speaks to, as we build new schools, and that's covered by SPLOST, there is still an unforeseen expense that goes with said construction. Yeah. There's a few I, few more items that I can clarify. Uh, so that helps to explain line item number seven. Line item number eight, let me help uh, clarify that a little better too. Uh, that's a decrease in $526,000. Uh, and I have a listing of these and there's, some small ones, but I'm just hitting the major items. But we're adjusting the accounts so that we're, we're looking at these accounts and trying to analyze them and say, okay, what should the budget be? Uh, for example, cell towers. We have a schedule of all of our cell towers. We know what revenue we're going to get in at what time of the year and which year. Some cell towers, we don't get as much money as other cell towers during the year, and the time frames are all different. So we look at those and we say, okay, how much is going to be for this fiscal year during this period of July through June, and we look at all those amounts and we say, okay, well, what should the budget be for fiscal year 2019? And we adjust the accounts. Exact, in fact, that's one we can adjust exactly, actually. Uh, another adjustment in here included is an adjustment for charter school funding. So Kennesaw Charter, their FTE assumptions, we're looking at an FTE currently of 836 but it's projected to go down to 589. So that's a decrease uh, of, a, of the budget that we need to take into account. Because on charter school funding, they get a portion of state funding, but they also get a portion of our local funding. So we adjust for those to take into account a lower student population at that school. Another thing that's a big adjustment for us, and this is a very difficult one for us to do that's also part of that total, is looking at the grants. Now we have a lot of grants in the other funds and you all have seen the grant uh, spreadsheet and I'll present that next time, like Title I and IDEA and all those. But we also have grants in the general fund and we look at each grant, we look at, we try to talk to the departments and to the state to determine, okay, what do we think that that grant might be next year? What is the total dollar amount? And so in those cases, we have to adjust both the revenue side and the expenditure side to make sure that we uh, get as close to the budget as possible because, uh, and, and that really doesn't matter because it'll get trued up in the fall when we actually get the grant money and the actual real number uh, when it comes to pass in the fall. Uh, we've looked at utilities, uh, but there isn't much change in utilities. We think that we've got enough money for that. Um, and I think that's, um, well, there's one more. There's MedAce and Medicaid, where we get reimbursed from the federal government for uh, administrative costs in working with the grants. And so we look at those accounts to see, okay, what resources do we have to put forward to get reimbursed for those administrative costs? And then we look at and make an estimate of what we'll get reimbursed for that. So that, that line item has a lot of those types of items, and I hope I've tried to explain that. Uh, in the best way possible. Um, the salary, in, the line item number six, I think I explained that. That matches exactly to the description. And line item number five, that matches exactly to the description as well because we have a formula that we have for new constructed schools for East Cobb and Brumby Elementary. The one-time costs are exactly what it is. Um, and then up in the revenue section, I think I've explained state funding in a fairly detailed way today, and as well as uh, local funding that um, uh, with the digest growth and those items. So I think that that is the the major highlights of the line items. And like I say, next time we'll have a budget notebook and we'll have more detail. Okay, thank you. Um, one question on item number four, the one-time expenditures. 
My memory of each one of those items was that we were going to pay those back with SPLOS funds and from SPLOS 5 funds when those funds became available. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't we be putting those back into the budget during that fiscal year? Uh, that depends on that depends on the timing of the reimbursement. Uh, but those expenditures were paid out of the general fund, so we reduced it out of the general fund. At some point when SPLOS 5 commences, that we will get reimbursed for that, maybe in next fiscal year, but I'm right. not sure of the timing. So that some of that could be considered into this budget, though, because at least a portion of it would be. Depends on the timing, and I know that there's a lot of uh, early construction for SPLOS 5 that'll happen in January and February, a lot of projects will go right on. So I'm not sure of the timing of that reimbursement. Right, I guess we could determine what timing we wanted to use on that. So yes, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Brad, thank you very much for uh, your work on this. And then um, I wanna make, make sure that I'm understanding something. On the TRS side of things, it's a $25 million increase this year? $25 million cost. Cost. Increase. It's an estimate. And then the state is funding how much of that? Approximately $16.5 million of it. Okay. Um, so just um, you know, by way of example, I know that what the state has been attempting to do is to shore up the TRS system. And primarily because of um, since the recession, I mean, the returns that the fund have actually received have been um, woesome at best. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're in, I mean, at the time we were earning, I think, maybe a quarter percent on our own investments. Um, but, uh, and then coupled with the fact that since 2008, there was a, a lot of retirements, a lot of people leaving the system and hence collecting. So. Um, and then because of that, and because there was also a lot of layoffs, there were fewer people paying into the system. Sure. So we have less revenue going in, we have more revenue going out, and we have a low rate of return. So I guess the, the question is, is that, do we have any indication how long the state will continue to, let's say, um, add that additional funds to the TRS? Um, as far as matching a contribution, for example, that we're paying? So the increase from 16 to 20 percent, that's a recurring increase, which, uh, which that's good. Let me make some comments on TRS. So TRS, the pension for teachers, is funded by three things. There's a deduction out of the employee check, there's an employer contribution, and then there are investments. And they, they have a, prof uh, a team of professional investors down in TRS. And so those three funding factors go into funding TRS. One thing that I've looked at, and I looked at their CAFR, TRS actually does a CAFR. And so the funding of the TRS program, uh, when you talk about pensions, and y'all have probably heard this before, the pension's only funded at 30% or funded at you know, some, some amount. TRS has always been funded at a pretty high level in the 80% range or higher or towards 90%. And one of the things that was worrisome as you looked at the, uh, the pension is that uh, it had gone from the middle 80s down to a low of 76% funded as a pension. Uh, but you all know that the environment right now with the stock market has increased dramatically. And so when, when I looked at the latest CAFR for TRS, the pension was, instead of being funded at 76%, it went up to 79%, and that was as of June of last year. I don't know the numbers for this year, but, I'll, but I do know from July to December of last year, there was a dramatic rise still in the stock market. I, I'm hoping that the TRS uh, program will be funded at over 80% at the end of this year, and, and I think that that's a good thing. And, and that should help mitigate these types of costs because the investors, the professional investors down at TRS, they weren't able to make enough return on the investment because of the market in general, also because of people retiring. But I think that the, the stock market now has come back a great deal and that should help mitigate it quite a bit. So that's a long answer to your question. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, out of the $25 million um, expense and that we're at 16 and a half as far as the state contribution portion of that, that's about 
two-thirds or 66 percent, all right? Is that about the historical norm, or has it been less or more, or how much does that bounce around? I don't, an I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. And, and that my, f my biggest fear is, is that that number drops significantly, and yet there's still a significant burden on the school district. But on the other side, I expect the state to continue that additional funding okay. for the teachers that we do have. And so uh, moving forward, it'll just be the new cost. And I'm hoping that TRS functions at a higher level in their investments to mitigate that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your answers. Thanks, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, line item number nine. That 7.8, where does that come from? Well, that's just part of the budget. That's part of the numbers that we added to the budget. Of course, in essence, we're using 7.8 million in fund balance. Okay, so that brings our fund balance down to $88 million, approximately. I won't, I won't really know what it is. The fund balance, the unassigned fund balance went up to 96. 96. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're taking It'll eight. go down a little, but I'm hoping that there's some uh, extra in the budget when we close out this year. I'm trying to be judicious because we want a fund balance, but we don't want it too big. And so that's why I offered this up as an idea for our superintendent con to consider. Uh, but whenever we use fund balance, I get a little bit nervous. But I think this is a, a reasonable decision. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 